Hi, this is Kylie Thompson, host of Food for Thought. Thanks for listening to the following podcast on Public House Media. Hello. Hey, man, what's going on? Hey, Jay, what's up, man? You ready to talk movies? I'm ready to talk movies. Let's do it. Welcome to yet another installment of Fear and There, your local neighborhood domestic horror movie podcast. This is Zachary. I am calling in from Beacon, New York. Oh, yes. And what a beacon of hope it is, Zach. A oh, beacon. We have to start beacon. the episode over now. That was a terrible <laughs> start for me. Can't do that. Uh, well, this is Jay and I'm calling in from uh, New York City. How are you doing, Zach? You having a good night? I was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having a, I'm having a very good night. I'm I'm extremely excited about this episode. Not only because it is a uh, a terrific film and it's gonna, it's gonna be a terrific conversation, but we actually have a guest on the show with us. Oh, another friends and family episode of Fear in There. That's nice. You know, it's actually about time we had a uh, theme song for this. I think you you should put together a uh, a little jingle for friends and family. I think Jay. you're just gonna like crank me up and make me do my monkey dance again and just write music for it. Yeah, it's entertaining. Mm. All right, well, uh, guest, would you like to intro yourself? Hey, I'm Asha. What's up? Where are you calling in from, <laughs> Asha? I'm calling from the fiery pits of hell. I mean, Los Angeles. Oh, God, yes. Oh, I yes. keep forgetting you guys are in the midst of yet another forest fire situation right now. Many, many forest fires. Many. The most forest fires that have ever been on record. My, well... We're going to learn a little bit about you in a second, but are you okay? Is everyone you know okay? Are you uh, far enough away that you are out of danger? Oh, yeah. It was, like, really smoky and foggy for a few days, and the sky was, like, yellow, and it looked like the world was ending. And it was kind of great. Great photos during that time, but uh, we're, all, mm. we're all good here. A beautiful yeah. silver lining for the, for the millennials and the Gen Zs out there. Yeah, great Instagram pics for sure. Mm-hmm, for sure. <laughs> well, the apocalypse uh, is photographic. It's true. <laughs> Very chaos fo- is photographic. <laughs> <laughs> dystopia is 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 photogenic. That's nice. Um, Hashtag dystopia. <laughs> um, well, Asha Asha here for our uh, for our listeners for our our few listeners out there. Uh, she is a, a wonderful friend of mine who I've known for years, known since college. Um, and has met Zach twice. He would want to make sure that that went on record. Um, <laughs> but she, Zach, but Zachary is the only one who remembers it of the yes. three of us. So. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, so Asha is one of my uh, one of my horror movie friends, and and so it's it's sort of been a a, a long time coming to have you on this podcast. Um, so we yes, are very has. excited. We are very excited to have you on board. Thank you for having me. Well, so yeah, before we kick off, Zach is, uh, Zach's going to ferry us through this episode beautifully, but, um, I wanted a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, we are on all of your social media channels. So if you'd like to hit us up, that's fear in there. That's A and D not ampersand. Uh, we are on Facebook and Instagram and all that jazz. You can also email us at fear in there at gmail.com and, uh, fear and there.com is a website on the internet. Uh, you can go there. Um, and Asha, uh, just before we, before we dive in, um, so I'm excited to have you cause you're a horror movie fan, but you also are a musician, which, uh, I've, I've played a little music with you before and your music seems very, uh, you know, sometimes it's not, but a lot of times it's very thematically suitable for a podcast like this. Um, so I, I wanted to ask you, how would you describe your music for, uh, for a, a never before listened to audience um i always think it's like a weird mix of like if trent reznor was the lead singer of coldplay (laughs) (laughs) what (laughs) (laughs) it's like dark sometimes and other times it's extremely poppy and uh it's like a weird weird blend i mean i just released a very very poppy song about like covid related matters and i was like wow should i release this this is like so different but 
I think mm-hmm. the people need this, you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we all need a, we all need a little catchy pop in our lives. But I would also say that, like, me being kind of a, you know, my my song writing prowess, you know, it leans toward of sort of folk pop singer songwriter nonsense, um, and I think. Uh, you usually have me on stage to uh, play guitar with you so that it's usually me and a drummer and you, I mean, not so much anymore now that you moved to the West coast. Uh, yes, but, uh, you usually have me on there kind of as a prop, you know, because, oh, <laughs> because... Yeah. oh yeah, I use men as props as we'll see in audition. Some yes. other people using men yes. as props. Yes. Yes. <laughs> see, I, I love that you picked up on that cause that's what I was going for. But, uh, but I always I always heckle you when we're at rehearsal working on your songs before a show because your your songs are always very you always call them poppy and they do they are catchy. I, I don't want to say that they're not catchy, but they're very dark in a lot of ways. Yes. And and, and, yes. and often very, very dark and sort of like horror movie electro pop is kind of like in I mean, some of your songs are, are, are not dark thematically per se so i don't want to pigeonhole you there but we did play a halloween show once where you wrote half of your set you wrote brand new songs about being a vampire so (laughs) yes people i've been playing a lot of live streams and i've been playing queen sized coffin and it's a fan favorite yeah asha so you want to tell people where to uh go check you out if uh if they are so inclined I got an Instagram, I got a YouTube, I got a website, and if you just type Asha Makes Music, you will find all of those things. A-S-H-A Makes Music. Beautiful. Um, Well, Asha, we are very excited to have you on. So, Zach, would you like to uh, take us away? Yes, absolutely. So, tonight, folks, we are talking about the 1999 picture Picture. Wow. Okay. The 1999 film Audition by director Takashi Miike. This is a staple of the J horror subgenre. Uh, it's sort of a notorious film. Um, I think equal parts for people, utterly entrancing and delightful in a sort of perverted way, and also thoroughly and completely disturbing to the point where. It's the kind of film that you could imagine people streaming out of the movie theater, uh, I would say, about two-thirds of the way through the film. Yeah. Um, so I am really excited to talk about this movie. Um, so usually the way it works in a typical episode of Fear in There, of course, there's no typical episode of Fear in There. They're all superlative. They're all extraordinary in their own ways. Um, but generally, we adhere uh, to a... Um, an order that begins with talking about the context that you had uh, or the context in in which you were sort of approaching this film. So I'll start. um, Since I was the one to recommend we do this film, um, Audition had been on my list, has been on my list to watch for years and years, like and and years and years and years. I remember being aware of it in high school. I took, for uh, misguided reasons, three years of Japanese when I was in high school, which was strange not only that I did that, but also that my high school, my public high school in Miami, Florida, offered three different levels of Japanese taught by three different people. Each that's, one more That's actually amazing. That is it, amazing. It, it would have been I'm amazing. Jealous. It would have been amazing if any of those people had been qualified to teach Japanese. Um, <laughs> but they really weren't. Um, I did. I did like the class, though. Um, Anyway, I, I was vaguely aware of the film back then. Back then, though, I was deathly afraid of horror movies, and there was no way I ever would have watched it. And then as the years went by and I became more of a, cine- a cinephile, this movie started to loom a little bit larger in my in my mind. And finally, this was the perfect milieu for us, or uh, for me to finally tackle it. So I, I didn't actually know very much about it. I knew the poster. The poster is iconic, um, showing our, our sort of, I don't know, our main villain. Uh, or heroine. Or heroin, sure. Uh, yeah, I know, absolutely. And that's that is very much uh, on the docket. Uh, that's that's a central a central point of discussion for tonight, for sure, for sure, for sure. Um, but that but that tremendous picture of her, kind of her head sort of twisting around her shoulder and down at the camera, and she's holding a horrible syringe. And all to me, all syringes are horrible. I'm I'm terrified of needles, so this movie was really tough for me. I mean, this um, is this is also like a horse syringe, so it's like oh, a yeah. big fucking yes. syringe. Yeah, a big, big, like for maximum pain, thickness, depth, all of the above. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. 
uh, for me, like I love, I love Japanese horror at this point. Um, so I, I, and I, and I've seen a decent amount of it. Um, in particular, I really like Kiyoshi Kurosawa, uh, Cure and Pulse, both being two of my favorite horror movies. Mm-hmm. Um, so to kick it over, uh, we'll start with our guest, Asha, mainly because I just desperately don't want to hear Jay speak. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, Asha, I would love to know, um, I, I know that you were excited about this pick. Um, I know that you're a fan of J-Har. Uh, had you seen this film before? If not, what did you know about it? How did you approach, uh, your watching of this film? And if you wanted, maybe you could even, you could even, uh, let's slip how you watched it, just the logistics of it uh, on your television, on a laptop, so forth. So go ahead. Sure. Uh, so I watched this years ago because I was very into Japanese horror. Like, I remember I went to Chinatown. I, I grew up in Boston and I would go to Chinatown. And I'd go to like these CD DVD stores and find all these J horror movies. Like back mm. in the day, that was like totally what I was doing in high school. Um, but I audition actually didn't really like reach me. Like I was more a fan of like The Ring and uh, The Grudge. Like those are my favorites. Um oh. But then I did watch this at some point. I can't remember when. And I remember distinctly not really liking it. Uh, Something about it, like, I think it was just because it was so different. It wasn't like the ghost stories. It was more Mm -hmm. of like a slow burn, which I don't Mm -hmm. think I really started liking slow burn films until Mm -hmm. more recently when I was like tired of the standard horror of like someone dies at the very beginning and then nothing happens for a while. And then people start dying (laughs) again. And it's like, all right, we've done this to death. But um, I... Yeah, I didn't really know how I felt about this movie. I, like, didn't love it. I was like, fine, whatever. Um, But then I watched it last night, um, and I watched it on TV. I actually watched it on DVD because my roommate has a copy of it, (laughs) believe it or not, Um, (laughs) uh, because she she lived in Japan for a time and also loves Japanese films. Um, So I was like, all right, I'm going to, like, actually give this a proper view, and I'm going to, like, put my phone away, and I'm going to pay real close attention to what this movie is telling me, and I appreciated it so much more this time around, and I think I caught... A lot more of the nuance that I think was totally intentional within the entire film. And uh, yeah, now I'm like, who do I really side with? (laughs) Uh (laughs) Who was right? (laughs) Right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Especially after Me Too and all that stuff. It's like it kind of has a different flavor to it. So I'm really glad that you got a woman involved with this one today because mm -hmm. I think it's important. (laughs) Absolutely. When I was, so I, I watched, I, I guess I'll just say my context cause I took the mic yeah. right from you. Um, I watched this movie probably 10 years ago when I was on that tear of, of, of like, I'm going to watch the most disturbing movies ever made. Um, and <laughs> I think we've all know, been there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. As horror fans, especially, um, I think, um, Obviously, the films that end up on that list, we've talked about this, Zach, like the Sato movies and like the 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 human centipedes of the world. And then you get Serbian like, film, Serbian film. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a good one. I mean, not a good one at all, but, you know. Oh, no, one. it's great. <laughs> what are you talking about? It's a classic. A good example. <laughs> um, and then and then you get, you know, uh, you get Cannibal Holocaust, which is the best title of a movie of all time. Um, but. Then there's there's audition, and when I watch this movie, I, Asha, what you're saying, and we're talking about a slow burn. Um, I mean, this movie is a very good example of a slow burn, but it's almost like a slow burn with an accelerant on the last twenty minutes. Like, yes, mm-hmm. there, there's no gradual, there's there's no sense of gradual pacing with this film at all. Like, there's there's sort of a a low plateau and then a super high plateau, and I mm-hmm. think. And I think that that's interesting, but what I know, what I noted, noted this time watching it, um, this is not, I, I would not call this a me too film per se, but it no. has, it has insanely, uh, I guess, poignant context in light of the me too movement. Now I'm not going to say me too in concept didn't exist in 1999, um, because that's the point it's existed through the entire uh, through the entire presence of mankind. Um, but when I watched this as a whippersnapper, you know, it must've been, mm-hmm. must've been like 2008, <clears throat> 2009, probably the first couple of years of college when I watched this the first time, uh, 
it, it, I, I thought it was a little boring at, for the yeah, first sure. for yes. the first 60 minutes, you know? And yeah. watching it this time, I couldn't have been less bored. I was, the whole time, I was, like, locked in, like, right. shit, what is happening? Like, this is awful. Right. Even before because the now you're picking stuff- up, you're picking up all these hints that you didn't notice the first time. That's for sure. I was like, oh, she's, like, always wearing white and... Like there's like these little moments like where they're like, well, someone's missing and all this stuff. And you're like, didn't think about it at first because it was like, whatever. Mm-hmm. Just, <laughs> Dude, to- to- totally. And it's like it's like the second viewing of this film is much different. But I also think a modern 2020 viewing of this film is crazy. And like, again, I, I want to reiterate, Zach wanted to watch this movie. You simultaneously, Asha, were like, let's watch a film I'd love to do, like a J-horror movie. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And so when this lined up, I was like, cool, let's do this one. But like, (laughs) I didn't, I don't want to have approached this with the concept of tokenism, but I think it's very important that we had a woman on this episode, which is what you just said. And I think, I didn't realize that until after the fact, like having Zach and I talk about this movie alone like would not have felt like it was capturing everything that was going on. And I think, let me, let me put it this way. When I first watched it, I did not have this much of a reaction to the like Mm -hmm. blatant misogyny. And then I watched Mm -hmm. it this time and I was like, Oh damn. (laughs) It's like, there's there's serious. Yeah. There's serious horror in the first like 15 minutes of this movie. Oh yeah. Just the men talking uh, about how they want a woman who is trained and like, it doesn't have to have a job. can do whatever. And I'm like, Oh, okay. Like they're literally shopping for women. (laughs) Yeah, it's crazy. Right, right. So yeah, there's my contacts. I also, I watched it just 10, you know, 15 minutes ago, it finished in my living room. That's right. Mere, um, You're fresh. Very fresh. Mere, so yeah, fresh. A mere, a mere 15 feet from here, I was sitting on a couch and like watching most of the screen, but a lot of it was covered by my fingers, you know, because <laughs> uh, the end yeah, of this yeah. movie, <laughs> the end of this movie is very great yeah. movie, So, um, and also I usually will have like one beer throughout a movie a horror movie when we were watching it um and then i'll have a drink or two while we're recording the podcast this was definitely a two drink movie for sure (laughs) um and now this is going to be a two drink podcast i think so by the end of this by the end of this cheers y'all you know we're gonna cut i have a glass of wine i have my glass of wine yesterday and i have my glass of wine right now so (laughs) beautiful beautiful so um Typically, at this point, before we put the spoiler wall da- down, we, we sort of uh, make the assessment of whether or not we would recommend this film. I want to breeze right past that. I'm just going to speak for all three of us and say, yes, of course, we recommend this film. Um, this is a film worth seeing. Um, is everybody okay that, with that? Yeah, that's yes. correct. Okay, good. Uh, all right. Jay, will you put the spoiler wall down since you, you're the one with the button? Yes, Zach. I, I will. Post I, this. I will. I will. I will push the proverbial button right now. <laughs> and here we are, Zach. Go ahead. Now that we're on this side of the spoiler wall, so there's a lot. There's a lot of ground to cover. Um, and I think our discussion was our was already really nicely set up um, by your comments, Asha. By your comments, but less so, Jay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so always put him down. <laughs> So always, you have to. Um, he would do the same if he was hosting. Um, so, so this is a film in two parts, largely. Um, yes, and they're not even they're not equal parts. Uh, no. it's, it's the, the rare it's the rare two act film for sure. Yes, it is very much a two act film. The first act occupies about a feature length film worth of, of of film. The first act is about 90 minutes. The final act is about 20, 25 minutes. Um, the film has a facade. It has a, a fake front um, in that essentially transpires or essentially masquerades as like a very, very good, very artful, but pretty sedate and pretty typical like romance film or, or yeah, yes. romantic drama. Um even the music uh, is like on oh, par yes. for like that time period, like romance right. Japanese movies. Right, right, and, and like very beautiful, very light, pretty ethereal. Um, uh, kind of, there's a little bit of like a circus aspect to the score, but but not in an evil sort of way, in like an, in like a genuinely comforting sort of way. Uh, and I think the score actually does a lot of the heavy lifting um, w- uh, of sort of where 
Takashi and Mike wants your sympathies to float in this film. So anyway, I'm going to start the conversation. I would like to start the discussion off with a pretty big challenge, which is the following. I think the film only succeeds if you are sufficiently disgusted by the first part of the movie. Uh, and by the actions of Oyama, who's ostensibly the protagonist. I won't say the hero, I'll say the protagonist. Uh, Certainly the character who occupies most screen time in the film. So Oyama, uh, you know, a salary man in Japan, loses his wife to, uh, I think, cancer. Um, And the idea is planted in his head that he will, he works in uh, in the film industry or the television industry, and he will host auditions. They will, his company will host auditions for a lead in a made up or at least a somewhat made up potential film. And in the course of doing these auditions, he will find his replacement wife. Um, So to me, uh, you're presented with a character, uh, Oyama, who is on one hand, completely complicit. And in fact, not just complicit, but active in a disgustingly misogynistic uh, oh, explicitly objectifying enterprise of finding a replacement wife, which in and of itself is a ridiculous concept and a, a really hateful and awful concept. Um, and finding a replacement life, uh, wife on the basis of, of what a woman looks like and what her accomplishments are, essentially. So, like, very reductive, very misogynistic kind of, uh, a kind of assessment. On the mm-hmm. other hand, he presents when he's not engaged in this like awful misogyny, he presents as an incredibly nice person um, who is a loving father, a caring father, who's kind to the woman who works for him, who is, you know, good at his job, who seems like a fairly respectful human being. He was, uh, he, he's was played... like, uh, he was ostensibly kind to his wife too, right? Like that's right. The, that's the right. The opening that's of this beginning. film mm-hmm. show, shows him as like a truly repentant, um, a very loving husband, person. He was a husband. loving, caring partner. That's right. That's right. Right. Um, and then, and then, and seven, seven years pass. Right after she dies, seven years and, pass. That's and right. He, that's right. He doesn't get married or, or theoretically <clears throat> date. Like we, you know, we don't really know much about it. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I just wanted to add that because it's it's also like how he ro- relates romantically to women. Right. Like right. On the up and up for for the mm-hmm. intro of this movie, if that makes sense. And he's played. And the last thing I'll say about his assessment is he's played with like a really, really, in a really sympathetic turn uh, by an actor named Ryo Ishibashi. Um, He's played, to me, really, really sympathetically uh, Mm -hmm. and and impressively. I I think his performance is quite good. So anyway, anyway, if you accept that his behavior in the first part of the movie is awful, which it is, but I think you really have to accept it for the second part of the movie, the revenge uh, part of the movie, you have to. I think you have to want him to be hurt. You have to also argue that it's actually revenge, um, because that's right. That's right. It might not be. That's right. It might. Not, yeah. Very well. Might not be. It might just be an impulse that she has. <laughs> well. Well, Asha. I mean, I think that's a, that's that's exactly where uh, I want the conversation to go. So, so if you will, I mean, say talk more about that. Uh, I think for sure on on one very easy sort of accessible read of this movie is that it is a revenge movie. Uh, similar in some respects uh, to a film that we did uh, several, many episodes ago, The Nightingale, Jennifer Kent's uh, film, another a kind of a revenge uh, horror movie about a woman who was abused and then who exacts her revenge. Um, this movie could be read in that way, but it also could not be. So I'm curious, Asha, to hear, mm-hmm. hear you talk more about that. Uh, Asha, I, Asha did, you see, did you see The Nightingale? I, I haven't because I've heard there's a lot of very brutal graphic rapes. Yes. It's so it's a, it's yes. very very hard to watch as a no, stay, as, yeah yeah yeah. Uh, yeah I might get around to it but uh, you know COVID's been hard so it's like I want to watch light things mm-hmm. <laughs> fun things yeah, <laughs> yeah right, right. <laughs> and then I had to watch this last night and I was like all right <laughs> yeah no um, take a break after this <laughs> yeah but I mean yeah so in my I I think it's because I've been watching a lot of like serial killer documentary series and stuff on HBO that I'm like. Yeah, part of it for her might be revenge, but I think a lot of it is just like a serial killer's impulse. Like she needs this is her next victim. She always knew like the second that he called her, she was like, I know that he's the guy I'm Mm -hmm. going to hobble next and like make into my (laughs) next victim and then like feed my vomit to him in my room. You know, like it's just it's part of her like 
impulse and psyche at that point. It's like who she is. It's how she like maintains the high or whatever, keeps living. It's like, you know, the guy that she has currently isn't going to do it anymore. And she got to get a new one. So that that's right. I feel like part of it. And then like, the, I mean, she does mention like, oh, well, you know, you used me as in like in this audition and you're treating women poorly. And I'm like, yeah, OK, part of it she probably enjoys. Like she doesn't look happy in this movie at all until the end. And she's no. like cutting his foot off and it's like total glee, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, I understand. Right, she's girl. like chanting. She, oh, yeah. She's like huge smile Kitty, on her face. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, my God. Yeah. They, that actress did a great job because she's like so deadpan the whole time. There's no oh, facial yeah. expression, no smiles. Not, even when she's like coming on to him in the bedroom, it's very like almost boring the way that she's coming on to him. And then like all of a sudden she has life, you know, and I'm like, well, you're crazy, bitch. <laughs> like, you're, like mm -hmm. this is like how you get your rocks off. Like, you know, so in my head, I'm like, it doesn't necessarily have to be a matter of revenge. It could just be like, this is how I get off. This is how I get by in life. I just need yeah. this. So, I so it's it's really yeah. I I I think that that reading is just as is just as valid. In fact, in fact, I think the film almost makes the argument more explicitly that this is not a revenge film. It's just that this is a particular example of a of a psychotic human being, which I well, it's I major catfishing. <laughs> yes, sure, it's like sure, sure. He, it's all about catfishing. She's like I. I'm going to pretend I'm who you want me to be because that's what you were looking for. But then I'm going to get what I want. What, what, what she wants. Right. What's interesting is like, so both of them are, are catfishing by definition. Yes. Yes. And mm -hmm. I would, I would argue that, uh, Aoyama, is that, is that his name? Yeah. Uh, o Oyama. I don't know how to say it in Japanese. Oyama. But, yeah. Yeah. Um, he, he was being more genuine than she was. In in a lot of ways, and and he I was think being she deceptive. was being pretty genuine at the like you know when she starts kind of opening up like she is telling him about her yeah, life and true, I mean she true. lies about what she does for a living but I think her emotions are real and all that stuff but it's just yeah, well, it depends like, on what what are we talking about though because there is there <laughs> is a definitive split in this movie where uh, the version of events that we have been given up until a point is suddenly called entirely into question. And we enter into a, a hallucinatory, a hallucinatory climax that, that is, that is anything but a, like, a, like, like there's no clear answer, at least the way that I, I, I watch the film. Um, well, but I, I, I think it muddies it intentionally is I guess sort of like where, where to answer your question, Zach is, is complicated because I don't, I think we talk a lot about like what is this movie trying to say because we often get in these like thematic intellectual conversations and I think the movie is trying to comment on two completely different things. It's commenting on this revenge concept which you're talking about which is th what happens at the end of the movie at least a shade of it is justified like that's part of what you could read from this film but the other part is that she experienced extreme trauma as mm -hmm. a child and and that that kind of trauma can only subsist in, in in a in an environment of evil and it can only like sort of develop evil. evil. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Beget. Thank you. That's the word. Um But so yeah, I, I agree with that, but I, I will just I just want to add and then I'll like, keep going, but I do want to add that I, I have no problem. Uh, classifying Oyama and his co-workers hijinks as it were uh, as part of the same universe as evil um, mm, as mm -hmm. as the people who abused um, um, what's her name um, I just lost it in my head uh, I have it written down Ayami Ayami is that her name? Uh, it's Ash, is it Ash, Ashami Asami oh, no. sorry Asami Asami, Asami. okay yeah, it just popped out of my head so I have no problem putting the audition like the titular audition in the same universe of abuse against women as uh the the ballet teacher burning her thighs and the horrible stories uh that are revealed later in the film about the, her family members abusing her they're, they they might not be the same they're, they're certainly not at the same level of abuse but they but they are they belong to the same universe uh that 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 the same patriarchal abusive universe to me without a well, doubt well, so, so I, and I think it's interesting that you bring it up because it, we have to bring up the concept of a spectrum here because sure. I think 
I think the whole point of the Me Too movement and the thing that really like helped me like understand how I should approach it. I don't remember where this article was. It must've been like Vox or, you know, one of those nonsense internet sites, um, but posted a really helpful sort of candid article about it saying me too is not saying that all men are rapists, right? Like that's not the point. The whole point is saying that 99.999% of women have experienced something that could be considered on the spectrum of me too. Right. So, it's everything like is a cat call as bad as sexual assault? Absolutely not. Right. Like that's not what anybody's trying to say, but it is part of a culture that is that and should be treated, you know, in the same problem as, as each other. Right. So it's the spectrum point. And to say that this misogyny and this audition that happened, you know, it, it, which was good. Like you said, I think the word hijinks was what you used, Zach, which... Yeah, kind of ironically, though. <laughs> I, 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 but again, it's, it, it was a perfect word for it because it started in, like, this sort of, this sort of like, cheesy piano bar. You know, the mm-hmm. it, it was his underling, I guess, who I thought was his supervisor, but it, I learned later that he owned the company. Yeah, so he's the company. Right, right, right. Right. So, so it was him goading him on. Like, we're meant to believe that Oyama is not that that person but he as a man succumbs to these sort of urges and these sort of goading by his colleagues to do this sort of thing and is that as bad as then asami cutting his foot off with a piano wire like no and i don't think the filmmaker is trying to fucking say that right no, like, definitely not so so i think it's interesting your point is well taken, Zach, because like if you remove the concept of misogyny and in, in that conversation they had at the piano bar, if you remove that predatory, that subtle predatory nature, I mean it's not even that subtle, but it's not again, subtle. It's, it's, not it's subtle. subtle. Com- compared no. to a compared to a piano wire, it's subtle, right? So, like if you take that out of the equation, this is definitely one hundred percent a damaged predator serial killer story right it's like a Hannibal Lecter kind of story um but it's not that and and the the first half of this movie as you so eloquently put earlier it it primes us for this movie to be a little bit more difficult to take at face value it 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 makes it more complicated it muddies the water at least least everyone is great yeah everyone is a great character no one is like purely even the son is like Mm -hmm. you know taking points from his son like when he winks at him when he brings the girl home i'm like okay you're gonna turn into your dad like right here this is that moment um so i i I found that devastating that i found that so tragic yeah um but i was gonna oh what i was i was gonna say because you mentioned that scene like in the dream when he's all drugged up and he's like Mm reimagining those conversations and in my head i'm like i think he was just hearing what he wanted to hear you know he wanted to hear that this girl had whatever life she had that wasn't too hard but just hard enough where she was like a person and kind of developed but Mm -hmm. not like so hard where she's been like actually physically abused by like every man in her life or pretty much every person in her life and then you Mm -hmm. see those conversations again and she's like very forthcoming about all the abuse and i'm like yeah maybe she did actually say those things but he was just hearing whatever he wanted to hear you'll never know because that's you know kind of left up to interpretation but it's kind of how all relationships start yeah (laughs) you know you hear what you want yeah Yeah, right. You have an attraction to somebody or you have some chemistry and you you desperately want that person to not be, I don't know, a serial killer. Yes. When they turn out to be, you say, oh, no. Unless you're me and then you're looking for them. (laughs) Right, right. I like so I'm glad you said that. I mean, that was my that was my first interpretation of of that sequence after he is drugged um, was that it was, it was a flashback as opposed to a hallucination. So we were actually seeing how that conversation went down, which I found to be just like extremely brilliant. Um, in the way that that whole thing was shot and presented, I I found it, it, it was a, it was a genuinely incredible twist to me, but then the, but then his sort of acid trip kept going and kept kind of rewriting the rules of the film in a way that I found slightly frustrating uh, and not necessarily in a bad way. I think frustration. I think frustration is sometimes a very effective and valid emotion to have while watching a very good movie. But like, I had a hard time understanding how he wound up in her apartment, and 
I, so, and then, and then it made me kind of think about the concept of POV of, of point of view of perspective in this film um, mm. and how, and what the film does with POV in really interesting ways. It, we are almost exclusively in Oyami's perspective, but there are strange moments when we cut away and we're, suddenly we're inside of a flashback and, uh, and it's, and it's unclear uh, whether or not we are, sorry, I, I shouldn't say that we're inside of a flashback. I should say that it's presented that we're inside of a flashback, but we don't actually know. The viewer doesn't actually know. Um, we might be seeing a flashback to how um, Asami got her burn marks, but we also might be seeing what Ayami imagines is that story. Um, well, in also, the, same way that the, movie, we see him- the movie ends when she dies, pretty much. Like, it's... I'm assuming she dies at the bottom mm-hmm. of the stairs. So it's like after that, the movie's over. There's no like ambulance shows up and, you know, picks, no, right. picks up his his foot and brings it to the hospital, tries to reattach, you know, like none of that happens. <laughs> right. it's, it's a very bla- black swan ending where she's just like, you know, looking oh, gosh, yeah. at him and mm-hmm. she's like, I, you know, I love you, whatever. I'm dead. <laughs> mm. Oh, she, yeah. She says they love you basically, but also she's repeating exactly the lines that she fed him at that dinner, which to me was kind of called into question any kind of genuineness yeah. on her part. No, I don't um, I don't think she, I think she's already dead at that point. I'm assuming she can't talk with like a sure. broken neck, but <laughs> Right, 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 right. Okay. Oh, interesting. So for you, those the words coming out of her mouth, he is imagining. Yes. Well, th- this is like an important very good. It, it, I it's like an that. Uh-huh. it's an it's an important conversation that you brought up, Zach. Um yeah. cuz there are no I think Asha, as you said, there's no fucking answers because we are meant to interpret this film and interpret those moments, those cuts, those dream sequences, those hallucinogenic moments. We are, Mm -hmm. we are meant to interpret those with our own baggage, right? Like we're supposed to understand whether or not they happened or not. Like to, to let you know, she might might have never been abused and all this is just like in his head. And that's like explaining why she's cutting his damn foot off. Like, who knows? She could have just been like, I've had a normal upbringing and I just like cutting people's feet off. (laughs) Right. Right. The bag, the vomit that could all be in his head. Oh, for Uh sure. It's, it's true. Yeah. And I think like to, to let you guys know how effective it was for me personally is like a semi tipsy viewer of this (laughs) film. Like, when he went to that beach hotel resort thing mm-hmm. with her, I was like, oh, this is a dream 100% of the time. And, and then right when he woke up and she had left, I was like, oh, this is still a dream. Like in my head, I mm-hmm. thought that it was not real. And so this movie is sure. is, is trumpeting this third point. Like we, we were talking about the predatory nature of, of the of the protagonist. And then we're talking about this serial killer damaged woman stalking him. But we're also talking about how much of this movie actually fucking happened. Like, yeah. and those are three very complicated things to reconcile all together at once, because I don't know. I don't know what at the end, like how did all of his, when she first, when she first uh, poisons him or, or, or paralyzes him with the, whatever she put in his whiskey bottle, um, mm-hmm. When she does that and then he passes out, you get this 10, 12 minute montage moment. And it's such a surprise. Yeah. Right, 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 right. I totally forgot about it. A hundred percent. And it's like, it's all blended together too. It's all things that happened earlier in the film blended in with things that happened later in the film. Or things that may never happened. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, right. So. Is it your understanding for either of you? Is your your understanding that Ayami goes to his apartment with for the express purpose of drugging him and torturing and ultimately killing him, or does she go to his apartment and then see him? The camera lingers very uh, um, uh, sort of ominously on the portrait of his deceased wife. Um, and to me, I was supposed to take that as okay. She sees. The picture she has, she had him promise that he would never love anybody else other than her. She sees the picture, then she decides to drug and torture and attempt to murder him. So, uh, uh, is it your understanding that she had she was on the premises with the express purpose of doing that, or was she motivated to the after seeing that he had ostensibly broken his promise of loving somebody else? 
What do you I mean, think, she, Asha? She did have a whole bag of <laughs> like medicinal like needles and everything ready to go. Um, <laughs> true, true, true. She true, has true, like a true. Dexter's kill kit, basically. Like, uh, don't leave home without it, though. You know, she, she yeah. never, you never know. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it's hard to say because she did leave the hotel and then he couldn't find her and he was looking for her and she pretty much disappeared and then she just like shows up again. So it's. It's hard to say, like, why did she leave in the first place? Like, leave the hotel, mm-hmm, if that actually sure. happened, whatever. Um, like, why did right. she leave? Why not just, like, keep the lie going of, like, oh, I'm getting closer to this man, and then I'm going to do what I want, or whatever it is. Because, like, it, she already seemed like she felt like there was something a bit off and that there might be other some other people that he's, right. you know, and beholden to, like his son or something. So... Like he was never, it was never going to be genuine because he's always going to have that son. So it's like, yeah, he can't only love you. That's right. Um, so and the son only loves dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> son only had love for dinosaurs. That's the real tragedy of the whole movie. But like, but but <laughs> the love of dinosaurs. I'm just wondering if if like she had you know a litmus test to like love me and only me and he passed it what would have been the difference would she had still have done the same thing because she i feel like she'd still be like you can't leave me if i hobble you you know like i don't think it would have really changed the outcome either way i think that's probably a good point right maybe maybe she would she would have put like three nest three less needles into his eye (laughs) Mm, yeah right so zero the the lover's amount of needles yes (laughs) that's how you tell people that you like them well, I, I like what she yeah. said about you can't lie about pain, you know, like you I, you can't lie about the way that your body is reacting to the pain I'm inflicting on you. And I'm like, OK, you like you should just be like a BDSM woman. Like you don't have to do all this. You can make mad money if you right. just had your own den somewhere. Get some in get Japan some, of all places. It's true. Get some leather people, whips. And people stuff, pay yeah. money for what happened to that guy. And especially in Japan. They're into some <laughs> weird stuff. Especially. Oh, Yeah. <laughs> There's also some beautiful shots, like when they go to the hotel oh, yeah. and she's like in the clouds. It's, oh, it's gorgeous. There's some very oh, romantic shots that I was like, wow, this is like oh, beautifully yeah. like laid mm-hmm. out and everything. Cinematography, excellent. Mm-hmm. And then just for at the end for her to just like throw the foot <laughs> at the, the door and it's just like blood splatter. And it's like, wow, what a dichotomy. Like, wow, like how those right. went yeah. from that to that. Oh, oh it's. It's stunning. I and the grain of the film, and there's like a, these expressionist shots, and oh, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole scene uh, in the ballet studio. I was completely mesmerized by. I, I, also, the audition itself, for what it's worth, is one of the best montages I've ever seen in film. It was exceptional. I just oh my thought, god, I, that I, like I, that like samba music that they have oh playing, my god. perfectly every, underscored. Uh, every decision was perfect. I mean, oh, yeah. I, I had to, I took real notice during the whole torture scene that there was zero music. It was just totally mm-hmm. her, uh-huh. her doing the like deeper, 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 like you know, doing the little sound effects <laughs> the whole time, just her talking and like just a lot of sound design of like the you know apron and things like that it was very like mm-hmm. right, visceral right. and just so different from the first part of the movie yeah so, it, it, so it, jay it, sorry we we wrestled it away from you you were talking about the slow burn concept no please. no i and i i think the point i was trying to arrive at was not probably not that the, that different all from right what, from what you guys are saying um stop zach skip, let me let this. me deprecate <laughs> let me deprecate no no deprecation um so only decapitation. Well, what I will say is, is when I read a, a a book which by by Murakami, which which is, you know, he writes in Japanese and then it gets translated to two dozen different languages. So some of it's lost in translation, but like all of the lines are like <laughs> so much of, of of the way that he writes and the way that he depicts Japanese people as speaking feels so much like. I don't know, aphorisms or or Mm. proverbs. And so much of that is in this movie. Like there's something about, and, and Asha, I think what you, what did you say? You said the, uh, when you're even during the torture scene, she was like, when you're feeling pain, you know, nothing is a lie or whatever it is. Um, they're like that line could mm. be something that somebody writes on like a fucking throw pillow, like. <laughs> and, I, I mean, oh I would God, I yes. would have that as a throw pillow shit. Uh, yeah, right, I right. love that. <laughs> so, so 
And, and Actually, there's a good chance to plug the fact that we have uh, fear in there. <laughs> it is a really good, good. I didn't even need to do that. Yeah, yeah. Head, head to fearinthere.com to buy throw pillows. Um, <laughs> <The> throw pillow. <laughs> so, um, mm. but I, I, the point I'm trying to make there is, is you guys were talking. You guys, as you said, you wrenched my point from me when you went off, but you were saying things that were supporting me, like. <laughs> the cinematography, the music choices, the color palette in this movie, the mundaneness of the way that they're saying essentially like super wise lines is mm-hmm. so much like a Murakami book and everything else in this movie is nothing like that. So it's like a really weird dichotomy for me because like I, I glommed on every third line I glommed onto him was like, Oh, that's, that makes sense. I could live with that. Like mm-hmm. <laughs> everything that they're saying. And even down to the, the production design of, of Oyama's office, which is like, when, when you think of like an office in a movie, you think like really well put together and placed his office felt real. Oh yeah. Felt like organized chaos. Like Agreed. there's, there's so much of this movie that was so perfectly executed for the concept of like a beautiful a 24 style art film. You know, That's there's right. so much of this that was well written, well shot, well produced everything. And what bothers me, maybe bothers the wrong word. What escapes me is what do they want me to go home with? You know, if I'm 1999 watching this movie in some, you know, in at the Angelica Center, would be my guess because it's a foreign film. Actually, the Film Forum, believe it or not, I saw, yes. I read an old review of it. Oh yes. Um, so if I'm walking home from this, like, what do they have me take away? Because they they've done everything right, right? But and I think this is what you were getting at, at the beginning, Zach, when you were asking, like you got to interpret act one this way and then act two this way. And then Asha, you were like, who is, <laughs> like, there's no black and white in this movie because it's like, obviously Oyama was wrong by setting up this audition under false pretenses. Well, even in bed, obviously, she was like saying like, oh, but I'm the heroine now. Like I'm the real heroine. Like there was that whole part. Right. They, I mean, they literally say that in the movie. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I, I, I don't know, like they did everything right, but I, you know, call it a product of me talking to you, Zach, you cynical motherfucker. I thank you. I, what am I, what am I coming home with? And that's like really what I want to know from you guys. Like, what well, is the point of this movie? I think there's two <laughs> points. I think, and, and I think it's from two different perspectives. There's his perspective, which is like, you know, like I wanted to find love and then I ended up really damaged and then there's this other woman who's like i'm already damaged and i want to find love but also i mean we can't even <laughs> we can't even forget the part where like he has that in his dream sequence where you find out that he also kind of had like an affair with his uh assistant i guess because they you know she right there's oh that God, whole right, right. awkward scene you know so there's there's a lot going oh. on here where everyone thinks they're the hero right. but actually they're both kind of just terrible people That's right. it's like real life <laughs> everyone's kind of yeah, just right. terrible <laughs> Uh, Asha, I I, ju- I just have to tell you that right now I'm I'm writing your quote down, um, because this is probably going to be one of our uh, promotional quotes. Just so you know, you're welcome. You've uh, I rarely you get royalties. I rarely know you don't. She doesn't. Don't lie to her. Yes, we'll she say, does. If we'll we get you three a- Instagram likes, if she gets three Instagram, if we get three Instagram likes, she gets one and a half of them. <laughs> nice. <laughs> yeah. I'll just say, I'll send you a fear in their throw pillow. Oh, sweet. Um, <laughs> so, Better say, no, but you I can't re- lie when you're in pain. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, we really have to rebrand. That's, it's too good. <laughs> yeah, I, I rarely notice the quotes that I'm going to pick for promotion during, um, right. d- during the podcast. But this one, which is, I just, it, it was like, he was, he said, I just want to find love. And I ended up really damaged. And she said, I'm already damaged and I just want to find love. Yes. And that's great. And and I think that that's, I, I think that's, that's, that's it. You're right. It's this sort of like dual point that they're making with this film, um, which is interesting. Very interesting. And it, yeah, depends on yeah, who I you think, side with. I'm sorry. I'm, that's, I'm sorry. It just depends who you side with. Like, are you a, a misogynist? Are you cool with what's going on with that? Or like, is, 
can you forgive that and be like what she did was terrible i mean obviously it is terrible but like if this was a woman who had been through so much abuse she might just be like i'm at my wits end and like that's it like uh, th- this guy's mm-hmm. crossed me and i'm i'm taking it in my own hands or feet whatever <laughs> I, I i want to one of my frustrations with the film is that i don't find like I think the most accessible read, like I think I said this earlier, is the feminist read of this film. And yet I think that Mike goes out of his way or not goes out of his way, but makes it a point. Uh, I don't know for better or for worse, I guess, of of complicating that reading. I mean, um, and I think that's Asami, what makes it a good film, because it's that you that there's just I, no, no I agree black with that. and white with that. It's she 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 has as far as we know, there are something like three, maybe four victims in the film. We only see we see we see one of them earlier, the man in the burlap sack. <laughs> but we also know about the owner of the bar, who's a woman. Um, if her victims had all been men, then the then the sort of uh, this is a, a a revenge fantasy type film. That reading would be much more accessible. But it's not. I mean, because one of her victims is a woman, that complicates things so much. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, it's still vengeance. It's still I, like he told me he loved me and only me, and she must die. Like I. I mean, I'm not saying it makes sense. No, vengeance. But it kind of sure. makes sense. No, no, vengeance. Ven- the vengeance read to me is is is, is easy, but but as a, a sort of a feminist read to me, that gets more complicated. Um, well, I I mean, you we I mean we we talked about this way back on our Candyman episode, which is like, d- I, which I mean I don't know if you remember, but like your concern and perhaps I think Robbie's concern, which we had, which I think he was on for that episode, well, yeah. um, was if this read this concept of 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 gentrification and this 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 black slave taking vengeance on on all white people who lynched him you know like if it was that clean why is he killing also killing impoverished black people right right, right. but I, I don't think that 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 wholesale undercuts a, a feminist read you know if you want yeah. to take the feminist read no, because it's rage at that point it's just like pure rage if yeah. that's it's just pure rage. If that's what it is, but I don't think she ever exhibits any like real rage. If anything, like I said, she's always completely happy when she's like murdering, <laughs> doing things, whatever. You know, she seems like <laughs> that's... she's completely happy when she's murdering. Yeah, <laughs> murdering. I know you could hear the apo- you could hear the little apostrophe at the end of that word. Um, yeah, uh, no, I think you're right. I mean, if she, if we're to believe that she, I mean, and we have reason to believe it, but. You know, if she is, and it's kind of reductive, but if she is simply like her actions are the result of of objectification, of abuse, you know, of oppression, marginalization, all of that stuff, then she turns into some crazy person. But like to just call her crazy or to just call her vengeful almost almost trivializes the horror that has been done to her. I mean, she she is like, yeah, there are physical victims in this movie. But the more we talk about it, the more I think that she is the actual victim of this film. And that's why I said, right. you don't it, it, know it's... if she's the heroine or the, you know, it's because right, from her right, perspective, right. she's probably doling out her version of justice. If that's what she thinks, you know, she's like, I'm just trying to live her goddamn life. Yeah. And all these men keep getting in the way and telling her what to do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This this damn record label, Japanese Department 2. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. It seemed like such a funny, fake sounding department, but nobody had an issue with it. I was like, OK. Well, I, I, I think <laughs> that's a little bit of like culture at the time and, 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 right, and, right, right. and like the translation. <laughs> um, I would be it would be a shame if we didn't talk to Asha about one one thing that I, we talked about this at the beginning, and I, and I kind of want to poke holes with with almost everything you said at the very beginning, Zach. Um, oh, good. We, yeah, when you when you were talking about J horror, to say, the phrase J horror to me, like, is a it's a loaded thing. If you say that, people assume. I, I don't want to say people. I think I assume the Japanese versions of supernatural horror films, you know, like the grudge and in Ringu and all these movies that like, that is when, when, when you say this is a J horror classic, I think most people would talk about those, mm. which, which kind of like, like reached the point of, of popular recognition a few years after this, you know, early two thousands was when things started to hit America, these remakes of the ring and the grudge and all that. Um, this movie is decidedly different. Yes. And so 
I was curious, and, and I wanted to talk to mm-hmm. Asha a little bit about this. So shut the fuck up, Zach. Um, yeah, happy. I. I, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about this, Asha, because when Zach, Zach told me, he's like, we haven't done any J-horror films. And I was like, you're totally right. Do you want to do like Ringu or do you want to do the Japanese grudge? Like, what, yeah, what, do, you what, wanna, what do you want to cover? you guys to do. And then you guys said audition. And I was like, OK. <laughs> oh, shit. Yeah. Well, Zach's pretentious as hell. So um, I, I also think Zach had just recently seen Ringu. So that was probably why we didn't end up that direction. Um I would not put this, if you told me J-Horror, I would not put this on the list because it is not part of that like, sort of popular lexicon. I agree so with that. I'm curious. Yeah. So, so like, what do you think of, like, how would you classify this film compared to those? Because, I don't know, like, supernatural Japanese horror films are kind of like a different thing to me. So, what... I don't know, like, as a J-horror fan, would you consider this part of the J-horror thing? Would you consider it, like, tangential? Like, what? how do you speak to that? I feel like it kind of stands on its own because, you know, like, I have this problem all the time when I'm talking about Polish cinema because there's not a lot of it that kind of translates throughout different, like, cultures. It doesn't really make sense um, because it's like, yeah, Polish people might really like it, but, like, if I watch it, it doesn't have the same element and, like, the same level of professionalism or something like it doesn't like translate well to like an american audience and like this kind of feels like one of those movies that translates to all audiences like anybody anywhere yeah. could watch this and kind of understand like this is a very specific film of a very specific time and place whereas j-horror it's like it feels like it could be a little more thrown away like it's like yeah this is great and i love j-horror don't get me wrong i love the ring all those movies but it's like it doesn't really say much different than all the other Japanese horror movies or is this one that's actually saying something it's like this is an opinion that I have and I'm gonna show it to you in two hours Mm. (laughs) yeah well I I, and I think so it's okay it's so interesting that you talk about the translating because Zach and I this is the third of, of three films that we've just watched in foreign languages these past few weeks um which Zach, I don't know. We didn't intentionally do that, right? Like, uh, I no, I wouldn't have known it until you pointed it out. No, I mean, two weeks ago we watched um, we watched Eyes Without a Face, which is a French film, and then last week we watched The Platform. Have oh you yes, seen that I have right. seen The Platform. Yeah, yeah. So not only has it been three foreign films, three foreign language films, rather, it it's three films that are like really gross. Um, so when 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 we were sort of talking about this i think i think they're separate things like audition is part of the horror film canon which is sort of what you're saying most japanese horror movies aren't uh actually gory at all they're just kind of based on like your fear of ghosts and the unknown and stuff and this one is like i was reading on wikipedia that it was like the inspiration for torture porn like eli roth was like inspired by this movie to make hostel and actually the guy the director is in i think a scene in hostel he's like one of the japanese businessmen like really yeah so like th- that's why i'm like this seems very different because most japanese horror movies are not torture porn at all <laughs> like they're so yeah. different than this so i think that's why it, it i wouldn't consider it like japanese horror per se i would just say it's like it's a it's a horror film but also kind of more of like a psychological thriller if anything yes yes and, and, and it's it's i mean it's it's it is very it has earned its place as an inspirational moment for better or worse, because I mean, even looking to something like hereditary, which came out three years ago or four years ago or whatever, um, she cuts a uh, spoiler alert, by the way, for hereditary, uh, she cuts her head off with a pia- with a piano wire, which like, <laughs> I have to assume had some inspiration from this film because the way she uses that piano mm. wire at the end of hereditary also, that's happened. interesting. How do you know it's a piano wire? Oh my god, he's playing piano when she cuts his head off. Yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Okay. I mean, I, like I have it. to. I don't know. I guess I don't know for sure, Zach. But it's it. To no, me, no, 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 no. But that's fair. That's. I mean, I think that's probably a solid enough uh, piece of evidence. That's cool. I like it. That's a great call. I mean, it's possible it's not, but I mean, we also don't know it's a piano wire in Hereditary either. I'm just sort of saying it like this sort of like cross cut like back and forth sort of cutting off of a head th- via a wire has not happened that much in cinema i would guess um 
So yeah, it's, it's interesting because because I, I and and I'm not I'm not trying to suggest Zach that you're incorrect in calling this J horror because it is a film that is a horror movie I mean, in the I, Japanese I'm language. Not- yeah, I'm not incorrect. I, I mean, I, I get what you guys are saying, but this is 100% considered a J-horror film. I, 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 I appreciate that you, that it's a problematic designation for you, but I'm definitely not wrong. This is a J-horror no, film. I, 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 no, you're I'm not trying wrong. To, to, back, to, to backpedal a little. I, I think a lot of people, um, you, if you said, what are your favorite J-horror films? I, I really don't think anyone would say Audition because Audition, first of all, is very, very difficult to watch. And it, like I would call, <laughs> we, we talk about advanced horror films a lot on this podcast. This is definitely advanced. This is horror 502, <laughs> horror class Because there's only, there's only one payoff, you know? A lot of horror movies are all about the payoff. It's like, how many deaths can you get in? How many gore moments? Um, blah, blah, blah. This yeah. movie only really has one payoff, and it's at the end. And it is worth it but it's like you said like 90 minutes of sitting through another film basically to get to this one moment Mm -hmm. that's like oh crap it's (laughs) well for for my money i would not i would not have loved this movie i I, well just full stop i would i would in fact probably hated this movie if i didn't thoroughly enjoy and admire the first movie (laughs) like like the like the romance drama so this is as good a time as any in fact it is nay i would say the best time to switch into our uh, into the final segment of uh, this episode, in which we rank or rate, I should say, rate the film that we have just discussed uh, on two different scales. The first one being its, I don't know, scary scale, uh, which Asha you could rate on a scale of one sheep to five sheep, being the amount of sheep that you have to count to fall asleep. Uh, don't. Don't explore that metaphor. It'll fall apart immediately. Um, um, So one sheep being you didn't have to count too many sheep to fall asleep uh, because it wasn't that scary. Five sheep being it was very scary and you had to count a whole five sheep to fall asleep. So (laughs) Zach, I feel like you have a serious problem with the sheep scale. We can make it as we can make it as zero to one hundred if you want. Like you're counting backwards before anesthesia or something. Would that help? I just don't think. I don't know if I've ever really had to explain it to a guest on the show before. Now that I'm explaining it, I just feel really silly. Uh, <laughs> that's that's the point. It's a very silly thing. So that is the point, isn't it? That isn't it. Okay. All right. Very good. So, uh, well, why don't we start with you, Asha? Um, scale of one to five, how frightening did you find this movie? How scared did you find this movie? Um. Okay. Well. Because I've seen it and because I actually don't mind needles at all, I'll give it a zero. But I will say that scene where she's like vomiting into the dog bowl, I literally was like, and I like almost could not. Oh, that's bad. Couldn't, that mm-hmm. was the part where I was like, ah, that that is just the idea of that is disgusting. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I have to ask you, what would your sheep's your sheep rating be for, for disgust for the first time you saw it? Oh, no. Well, I mean, it can be read as disgust too. I mean, oh, for disgust, it, I, I give it, I give it a five, honestly, for disgust because it just does it such a great <laughs> job of making me like be like, yeah. oh Zach, god, no. Zach, do we need do we need do we need to interchange? So when it's a, actually like a scary, like a viscerally That's scary movie, it's sheep. But when it's a disgusting movie, it's bowls of vomit. Yes. Yes, bulls. I give it yeah, bulls five either. bulls of yeah, exactly. vomit on this one. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect, Jay. How about you? And you can use you could use either metric you want. <laughs> well, I think it's. I mean, I think it's pretty scary. I, I don't think it's jump scary. Um, the, though I, I will say, having seen it before, I'm curious, Zach. This is your first time watching this film, right? That's right. Um, I'm. I am curious. Um, how scary was the bag roll scene when with the first time you saw it when the when the bag started moving well that it's a good question uh i have a i have a straightforward answer for it but i wouldn't be me if i gave you a straightforward how answer. many bowls just um, tell us how many <laughs> bowls of vomit oh the bowls bowls five bowls um one sheep for okay. scary but i will say it it brings up a problem of the genre um uh, and I, and I'll, I'll be I'll be really short here, which is just to say that I knew this was a horror movie. I saw a misshapen burlap sack. I knew there was a body. Of course, of full course. stop. Yeah. Like, I, yeah. and so it wasn't scary. It wasn't even. Yeah, but did you scary. did you not know? Like, did you assume that the body was alive? 
Sure. I, I, I don't remember, but, but like <laughs> it jumped it, when it moved, I said, okay, there it's moving. I like, it didn't, that's, but that's the issue. You've like, seen I, too many movies. that I read about too this many film. Movies. Well, that's what I, exactly. One of the critics, one of the, one of the reviews or one of the, one of the essays that I was reading about this film after I finished it was said that the best way to watch this movie is to, is to burn it onto a blank DVD or put, or mit, or, or label it something different on a hard drive and give it to a friend who has never heard of it and don't say anything to that person. And then, and maybe even say that it's a drama. Maybe even just get, say that it's a great Japanese, it's a pretty artful Japanese drama, you know, from the late 90s. Yeah, it's like, like, that, it's like, it's like, it's like the Japanese, it's the Japanese Annie Hall. <laughs> Sorry, I don't, I don't, I don't need to, to, to it's code a, Woody It's a Woody, Woody, Woody Allen movie? Harrelson. No, Woody Allen. Woody, Harrelson. Woody, Harrelson. Woody, Harrelson. Woody, Allen. Woody Allen. Jesus Christ. <laughs> This is what, what happens when I drink. This movie is actually white men can't drunk. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's actually Zombieland. Um, Zombieland. I I've so, had too many drinks. Oh my God. Okay, well, so I, the reason I bring it up is because that jump scare is often quoted as one of the scariest jump scares in horror movies. Because, um, I mean, it is remarkably unex, uh, unexpected if you're not coded to watch it. Like, yeah, to, if you, to see it right. happening, right. which is what you're right. saying exactly. Um, to answer your question, I think it's about two sheep and it's definitely five bowls of vomit because it's, it is, I don't think anybody would say that this movie is not uncomfortable to watch. Um, I'm, I yeah. think I remember I was late starting this podcast and I was like, Oh, sorry guys, I got, I got about 10 minutes left. And you guys were like, Ooh, the best 10 <laughs> minutes. Um, and, and I think we all know what that means if you've seen this film. So, um, Yes, I think I, I do think it's about two sheep because it is it is scary. There are moments. It's psychologically are, scary, like someone catfishing yeah, alarm, you. You yeah. don't really know who you're. You know, you might never really know who you're seeing mm-hmm. or talking to or dating. Mm-hmm. Like everyone's got a history. <laughs> Some people are serial killers. You never know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. You never know. So Asha, Jay, Asha, are you a serial killer? Is this the long you, game? You'll for you? never know. You never know. Oh my god, I'm going to be murdered. But I will I will say this actually well, at least you guys never inspired know. me. I think I'm going to be a Sami for Halloween this year. I've already started getting my costume nice. together and uh, I'll probably get a fake foot oh, shit, and tie nice. some wire yeah. around and carry it around. I will I will say some of her like some of her like ambiguous mannerisms remind me a little of your stage mannerisms at times. I will take that so. as a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> so, Jay, let's stay with you. Um, for your um, quality rating uh, scale of one to five pentagrams, if you will. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is. I'm gonna give it a. I'm gonna give it a four. Um, not. I almost gave it a four and a half. I mean, this is a high quality film. You know, this is one of those movies that I think you can see right right away the care and the art that went into it. Um, but I mean, there are some moments that I just thought were like overdone um i think one of those moments that comes to mind is when he's about to go into the i think it's the the old fish <laughs> what's it called the cold fish the stone, the stone fish, fish. Yeah. yeah when when he's about to go in there and he, and he runs into what i we can only assume is the tokyo equivalent of the gas station attendant that tells you to <laughs> not go down that road um, <laughs> right. um, and he looks over and he sees a hallucination of a tongue flapping on the ground mm-hmm. like again this is blood this is sort of like introducing you into the second part of the film where he starts hallucinating a lot and starts dreaming a lot um so i understand the stylistic reason but his acting response to that like him jumping up against the wall and him like was <laughs> like a little much and I, I just thought they oversold it when they didn't need to at a couple of points okay. so um it's a four for me for sure great great and how about you asha uh so the first time i watched it i probably would have given it a one i say this time i'll give it a solid four just like jay mm-hmm. okay it's so weird. This movie ages well, which I do not want to say about this movie. I mean, I watched it on DVD, and I was like, is this going to be in standard def? But it wasn't. <laughs> it was widescreen. It was great. Was it a blank DVD? <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> as, as Zach. As, and no <laughs> Japanese girls came out of the TV, so that was a bummer. No. Uh, it wasn't yes. listed as, like, home movies, 1999 no. or something like that. <laughs> Seven days, Asha. Seven days. Just Danny's trip to Niagara Falls, or you know. <laughs> um, so, well, I guess it comes to me then for the final. Um, I give it four and a half stars. I um, my my first reaction when I finished it was four, uh, but more time that has passed, the more that I appreciate it. I keep coming back 
to this one sort of simple thing for me, which is that I think this movie kind of pulls off something that is almost impossible, which is it is a absolutely horrifying horror movie that pretends to be another film entirely in a completely different genre and completely and utterly to my mind nails it. I I find that the first, like, I, I mean, I guess that I'm, I'm lucky in some respects arriving at this movie now as an adult who's, you know, in love with movies and, and has seen so many of them that like, I, you know, I know that a lot of people find this movie to be very slow. Um, but I, I don't like slowness is a virtue in movies to me, at least if they're good enough. And so, I, and this was a really good movie. Um, <laughs> and so I had no problem with it. I loved hanging out in that universe in this like strange misogynistic romance drama. Um, and I loved the ending too, for what it's worth. But, but, but I actually like, I just thought these were two very, very different, very, very good movies that get some really effective connective tissue. I, I, I was, I was really, by the end of it, I was really enamored by it and I thought it was just wonderful, uh, which is probably a strange word to use, but yeah, still. That's, that's not, this movie was not wonderful. Delightful. Delightful. It was delightful. <laughs> Sorry. Like a freshly baked cake. Oh, it was, it was a pillow. It was a cool breeze. It was a <laughs> dew on a lotus flower. I don't know. Um, well, Zach, well, folks, Zach, Zach, thank you so much for, uh, for hosting. Um, yeah. And Asha, thank you so much yeah, for thank guesting. You. This is uh, fun to watch this movie again and talk about horror movies. I don't get to do this all the time. Well, you'll have to come back. You'll have to do it again. Don't, don't forget to Google, to Google both Asha makes music and fear and there, because we will, uh, we will offer you two very different types of entertainment. <laughs> so, and if you act now, you can buy a throw pillow at its uh, usual price. Twenty nine ninety nine, <laughs> which I think is, I think it's I have like, no idea. I actually. think it's like fourteen dollars or something. I have to say, I don't. I haven't bought any of our merch. I don't. Why would you I, buy your I, own merch? I don't know. I'm I'm waiting for someone to give it to me, but I think I might be waiting. I think that's forever. a hint, Jay. That's <laughs> I a think hint. I, <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll buy it. I'll buy it for you as a wedding gift, Zach. You never get me anything, Jay. <laughs> well, all right, anyway. folks out there in fear and Thereland, thank you so much for tuning in. If you tuned in, if you didn't, then uh, we have nothing to say to you, and you're not even hearing us. So the joke's on us. <laughs> um, Asha, again, thank you, Jay. Thanks for nothing. Um, and good night. This was uh, another terrific episode, if we do say so ourselves. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll talk to you guys soon. Good night. All right, bye, friends.